Hi, this is Kate Elliott. I'm here with Narrative World Season 4, and back with me this month is Susan Dennard. Hello. Did I pronounce that right? You did. You got oh it. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Actually, you know why I remember that now is because you have that thing is de nerd, and I'm like, yes, I get that. Plus, it yeah. also makes me feel... It's it's very resonant for me. <laughs> I mean, I, I I always make a joke that it, it should be Denard because it's French, but uh, um, it's not even my French husband's name. It's my family name, but we're from South Georgia. So I got turned into Denard, 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 Denard. Oh. So Susan is um, the author of The Truth Witch. And is there a series title for that? It's The Witchlands, yeah. The, the Witch Witchlands, that's right, that's right. The Witchlands books and the um oh don't worry God, I just no I know what no. I should have done this before what's just, the one with the with no. the skull on the cover the new ones are the, the new one show me show me that's going on yeah, right now oh, and then I have some out of print stuff <laughs> as we do um yeah and... so last year we talked about you are not a failure yes that's right Right. And we talked at length um, and I'm not I haven't even introduced narrative worlds, but people who are watching this know already. Um, and for th those of you, I think there's at least there's a couple people here with us so far today. Remember, those of you here for the live recording can ask questions in the Q&A. Please do if you have anything you want to say, um, please feel free um, for those watching this on YouTube later. Um, thank you for being here. So today we're gonna talk about the other subject we have discussed um, in the past, which is navigating the pressures of writing, coping, caring, recalibrating. And this is a very February topic, I feel like. Yeah, right? it, yeah, yeah. And it's a very like, I'm under really intense deadline right now. So it also feels very appropriate. Um, so, Yes, the pressures of writing when you feel like you're stuck in a in a in a pressure cooker, you know, and you're just gonna explode. Uh, how do you be creative when you? Uh, it's so one of the things that people, some people say, you must write every day, but in reality, many people cannot write every day, and there's a ton of reasons for that. And it always has, you know, when I was. When my kids were little, I have three children and they're all now in their early 30s or mid 30s. I think one is in their mid 30s now. But anyway, I don't I stopped keeping track of their ages now. But um, when they were young, sometimes someone would get sick and I would have to deal with them being sick. And that meant I couldn't write. So when people say write every day, it means they have the facility to believe that there will always be a way for them to write because they won't have anything else impinging on their time. They won't be ill. Someone else will pick up any slack that happens or they can buy the time somehow. But most of us don't have that luxury. So one of the things I think that I struggle with is this idea that I should be doing this yeah. and I am failing by not doing this when really what I need to do is navigate the pressures and recalibrate how I approach my writing. Yeah, easier said than done, but yes. I mean, I yeah. think that's even just a whole human instinct where we should be working, particularly our American roots. <laughs> I think the capitalistic roots, the factory, yeah. that factory yeah. is moving and you've got to get your widgets, uh, you know. Have you ever read the book or heard of 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman? I no. love that book so much. It's Tell not me more. Anyone, but I love it. He is a guy who made his whole career on teaching and like productivity. He did productivity columns everywhere. He wrote essays about it. And he was always trying to like try the new method, become the most productive guy and everything failed. Um, and he finally sat down and he wrote this book, 4,000 weeks. Um, and when he wrote it, he was the parent of a toddler. So I connected deeply. <laughs> um, and it was just about how in reality, if you look at the average human lifespan, we only have 4,000 weeks on this planet. And so if you accept that you will not ever be able to get everything done, you can allow yourself to be freer. Um, and it's a lot more than that, of course, but that's sort of the moral takeaway. But 
one of the things he goes into is the origin of how we we as a society got to this point where we constantly feel like we should be doing more. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really interesting book. I loved it. The um, audiobook is fantastic because he narrates it and he's um, a quirky British guy. So uh, I highly recommend it. It definitely helped me get to a better place. Um, and one of my favorite lines, though, in the book, and he's talking about toddlers, but it it's everywhere. But it, it, the line is toddlers take the time they take. You cannot rush a toddler. No, no matter what. You, it doesn't matter. You're just trying to get your shoes on. I don't know how it takes us so long to get out the door, but you cannot make a toddler move faster. You cannot. They take the time they take. And he applies that beyond to life in general. Some things just take the time they take. And I've, I've thought about that a lot in the context of books. Some books take more time than others, but yeah. they all take the time they take. And I, the structure of publishing doesn't really allow you space for that. And I understand, like, I, it's a business. I do understand why. Um, so this is not me trying to shade on the system necessarily, but it, it does not, creativity is not a widget, um, which is also something he talks about in the book. Like a lot of these things that we are expected to do quickly cannot be done quickly. Um, and yet somehow that is what our society has become. A lot of mental creative tasks have been turned into how can we be more productive with them? And it, that's really not how it works. Um, and I, I mean, I know for me, I, some things take the time they take. And when I try to rush them, the quality is crap and I'm not happy with it. And it's my name on it forever. So there's, you know, there's also then this assumption buried that I was like, you have to, because I too understand the need for deadlines. You need to bring out a product when you say you're going to bring it out or yep. But also there's a lot of time and money invested in the production schedule. And if it gets disrupted, it disrupts more than just that one book. So that aspect of it, I completely understand. But at the same time, this idea that being on time to a rigid or even a rushed schedule is more important than the quality of the work can sometimes make it feel to us as the writers that what we're writing isn't really that important. Is it a little worse than it would have been if I'd taken more time? Well, who cares, right? You know, if, if it's this sense that it's almost dismissive towards the art, it's just, you know, it's product, it's commerce, yeah. as opposed to this is something that we're trying to say something that is our vision and our perspective and our, you know, our blood, sweat and tears. And we'll, you know, I don't, it, it's that aspect of it, I think is part of the pressure of writing that I have found debilitating over the years yeah. when I feel like, well, who cares, right? Not that people need to care, but if I can't make my deadlines, then who cares? I should have made my deadlines. I should have made it worse in order to make my deadlines, as opposed to I made it the book I wanted it to be. Or I had other, I, I had other responsibilities I had to deal with. You know, yeah. I had premature twins, for yeah. example, not recently, obviously, but you know, <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I mean, I did a newsletter and I think I talked about this a lot on our video last year because I, I did it in late 2022. Um, about how I nearly died in childbirth and, yes. and and I came home and still tried to finish a book under deadline and gave myself shingles. Um, and like, it wasn't like I nearly died, you know, she's being hyperbolic. Like I nearly died and I was in physical therapy for a long time. Um, so I, yeah. And I was in the hospital for a long time. And so it's like, and yet, and yet, and I vowed I would never do that again. And I am now finding myself spinning into that place again of like letting the pressure of the book win over everything else. Um, and at, at, as, I shouldn't say over my child because she always takes first position. So, mm -hmm. you know, I keep losing days because she's sick a lot and she also has severe asthma. So we, mm. we have it's very deadly, especially when they're young and it's scary. And so we lose days yeah, yeah. weekly to this uh, management. And I, as the flexible job, I'm the one who have to, I have to take over. 
Um, and I have accepted, I used to try to work when she was home and I've accepted that that is, especially the older she gets, it's not like she naps. So I, I can't, um, which is a hard thing to accept, uh, <laughs> but she's number one. And then I'm putting book number two, which means I'm putting like my own health and things. I'm watching them derail and I am letting it derail because I'm like, well, if I could just get three more weeks, what are the long-term consequences of that, Susan? Come on. <laughs> like, yeah. You've been here. You gave yourself shingles from stress. Like, why am I doing this again? And I actually had a wee meltdown last week with my agent because I was like, I vowed I would never do this again. Remember, it's even in a newsletter. And here I am doing it again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she's awesome. And we had a great call and I felt a lot better after that. Um, because it's also, on the one hand, it's good. It's bad to feel like your book doesn't matter and that they're willing to just put out a book to get it out on time, which I do understand. Again, going back to, there are all these people depending on you inside these different departments. Um, but at the same time, when you realize it's just a book, I'm not preventing nuclear war. I'm not operating on somebody's brain. I am just writing a book. I also think that can help relieve some of the pressure. Like, what is going to happen? Yeah, it sucks. And it's really shitty for everybody who was depending on me to be here at this time. But it's just a book. It's just a book. We got to remember that. There's the book. No one is going to die because I didn't finish this. But I could give myself serious long-term consequences if I continue to sit here and exist in my own cortisol, you know, my own <laughs> stress-induced inflammation. And I, I try yeah. to remind myself of that. Like, at the end of the day, it is not actually... It is that important to me, but it is not going to kill anyone if I don't finish. But it could potentially harm me long term if I don't if I don't reckon with this stress. Um, and and I, some people, my agent pointed out, she was like, "Some authors don't care, Susan. You need to be more like them. If a deadline comes and goes, they're like, "Hey, sorry," and they just get back to it. Yeah. And I was like, "I yeah. can't imagine existing that way." So many people depending on me that I'm going to let down. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to embrace that. <laughs> you know, what strikes me too, and something that I think people who have this tendency, so, so for the people who are like, oh, I'm not going to make it, you know, that's fine. I think that's, there's ways in which for some, in some situations that can be, um, born out of privilege and selfishness. But I think in most situations, it's healthy to say, you know what, I can't yeah, make it because of these other things, right? But what I found for myself, because I'm like you, I get really, I, I, the, I feel the pressure. And I've had to like, step back and say, so what are you really feeling? Mm -hmm. Right? What's, what's driving this? And for me, I think it's always this kind of commingled sense of fear and anxiety. I'm If I don't make this deadline, they're never going to publish it and they're never going to publish anything by me again ever and my career will be over and that'll be the end, right? And so it's when it's fear and anxiety driving you, you make bad decisions. And yeah, you make decisions and based off things that may or may not be true because you could make your deadline. Story. Yeah, yeah, you could make your deadline and your career could still tank. Not that I mean to be discouraging, but you know, it's reality. <laughs> it's the reality, right? So is it it's not the missing the deadline by itself no. that's gonna do it. And if it then creates other health health issues or you know, family issues mm -hmm. that that are gonna have repercussions down the line, you have to always balance that against what it is really in there what is really driving that and that can be a hard conversation to have with yourself but i think a really useful one mm -hmm. yeah i agree and i at the end of the day i have done this many times much to my poor publisher and editor's chagrin editors plural over the years i if i don't feel like the book is there then i will say sorry and and they have yeah. to rethink, they have to recalibrate. And I feel terrible doing it. And I try to give them plenty of heads up. But like, if I can't get a book where I want it to be, then I'm not printing it. I, it is, it's not people who are, they're not going to remember the little publisher logo at the bottom. They're going to remember the name of the author when they read it. That's right. 
And that I think is going to have much more long-term consequences for my career than anything else. I mean, the reality is, is you can indie publish these days. So uh, I would rather have readers read my book and be like, holy shit, Susan Dennard nailed it. <laughs> and then, then, yeah. then turn out something that's lukewarm, but hey, maybe guarantees I get one more contract. It ain't guaranteeing me for the rest of my life. And whereas I do think good books can. So but yeah. we have to live with that as the artist, as the writer. We have to live with the consequences of the decision to turn in something that isn't quite what we want. And by that, I don't mean that. To, you know, I look back on the books I wrote 10 years ago and 20 years ago and even, God help me, 30 years ago. And I say, I look and I say, oh, I could do that better now. Well, of course I could do that better now. But I did it the best I could at the time. So that's always my goal. I'm going to write the best book now that I can. And it isn't worth it to me to write something that's not as good. I mean, I, yeah. first of all, I can't stand it. I mean, it bug, it just, even the thought of it is enough to make my skin crawl. Oh, I know. I physically yeah. cannot write it that way. So, which I think it took my agent, we've been together for like 14 years now. And it took her a long time to figure that out that like, oh, Susan really cannot just give a book or just hand in a first draft. So like I will write and rewrite it a million effing times until it is exactly the way I want it. And now you can look at it. <laughs> Yeah. And I just physically can't. I can't. And it's okay. She just, people accept. Yeah. Uh, so, so I will say to that, I can turn in earlier drafts than other writers I know because I don't care. Um, but I can't finalize a revised draft. Mm -hmm. And we each have our I'm team, absolutely. Right? And I do a lot of revision. I, I do. Yeah. So it has to be. And I can't speed up writing something that's just hit like a muddy patch. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I, and that's like, I, so I jump books a lot because I get stuck a lot. And for me, I just, yeah. I, I'm someone who likes to, okay, well, this is stuck. Let's move to something else. And that's good and bad. Cause it means I have a lot of things going, <laughs> but it does mean that things take the time they take. But what I have discovered is that if I sit there and simmer in the stuckness of this project, it still takes just as long if I had yeah if I had let myself go work on something else for a month yeah, um, and the benefit and then you have something, something else. Yeah. Then you have a chunk of something, of something right? else. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I am so behind right now because I had two books due last year, which mostly got finished, but neither got fully finished. So now I have three books due this year and I am, oh. um, and it's not just due, they have to be in copy edits and we don't have time for developmental edits. So we're going from me to copy edits. And I don't feel great about that at all. Um, no. But but you are I, an experienced writer now. So I you am, know what you're I, doing. And, I, and like yeah. I said, I revise something a million times on my own before I ever let anyone else see it. So I do have that at least. Like I know that this book has been worked and reworked because I am just that kind of a writer. Um, and I feel pretty good about that. But yeah, I mean, I'm also tapping a bunch of friends helping me like, okay, read what I've got. Here's act two. Read that. Does that look okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, this is not ideal. I don't love this, <laughs> but, but I will be very close to the deadline if not right on it. <laughs> That's very impressive. I, I, I'm, I'm working on, I'm waiting for an edit letter for a finished duology Mm -hmm. I'm that I wrote because I was stuck on something else. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I'm now working finally on that thing I was stuck on and it's going slowly, but it's starting to go. It's st I'm starting to feel like I'm over the gravel and it's like, I feel like I'm getting on the paved part of the road. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. so, well, the bumpy dirt, maybe I'm onto the gravel part now I'm off the bumpy ruddy <laughs> thing and now I'm onto the gravel part. So, and, and so that feels good. Um, so, but I don't, I don't know that I could have pushed this thing, this, this book, it's the third um, of the sun books, because it's unbelievably complicated. And yeah. it doesn't have a lot of leeway. It's like, by the time you get to book three in a trilogy, at least for me, that. oh you, yeah, you, you, you've like, you've closed a lot of doors yeah, on the way, right? And now doors. you're like, now it's yeah. like, here's what it's got to be. It's not like I can say, I'm going to throw that out because I set that up already. And yeah, so if no. I throw it out, it'll be like I dropped it, you know, so, so, but it's moving and that makes me feel good. Um, it's, it's, and it's so late that I, that it's gone. It's so late, like years late that oh, I'm just I'm, like, oh, well, 
I mean, yeah, that's like, it's like that's like that ship sailed and now we're waiting for the next ship. The witch lands is that way. The last witch lands is yes. years, years. And that's, yeah. I, again, it's the sixth book in a series. And I had a lot of trauma wrapped up in it and I needed yep. to heal from that before I could get back to that book and that series. Plus all of the, like you said, you're locked in. <laughs> and so it just took me a very long time to get there. And um, I spent most of last year writing most of that book, but that's the one that's what's due right after this one. So as soon as I finish this one, also a series closer, I have to jump right into that and finish it. Oh. Um, so you said something so important there. You said I had to heal mm -hmm. and I just, I think this matters to people who are struggling with that sense of there being a scar or injury or wound or illness in there. I'm going to call it their, the spiritual, whatever of their artistic, you know, we don't really have words. Well, we have words for these things, but each person is going to approach it differently. Very, um, yeah. And I think, I think it matters if you have to heal to take that time, because if you don't heal, you, you um, if you can, and I know that not everybody can, and it's okay if you can't to just push through, um, you know, not to feel guilty about that either, but it is okay to say, I need to heal with this. There's something about this. I have to heal before I can move on. Um, and sometimes when you give yourself that space, it works. Yeah. I, mean, I rediscovered the joy of writing. Exactly. Because I allowed myself to step back from something that was too painful. Yeah. I mean, big same. I, I did too. And like, I, on the one hand, it sucks putting years between books in a yeah. series um, yeah. for the readers, for the publisher. They've been very kind about giving me that space. Um, I mean, I will have published an entire trilogy between the fifth Witchlands book and the last Um but I couldn't, it was just wrapped up in way too much personal pain. And I, I didn't, I couldn't work on it without, it's not even that you necessarily, that I was conscious of reliving things, but you start working on it and you're like, nope, this doesn't feel good. Yeah. I can't yeah. do this. I don't want to do this. I need to work on something completely different, which is what I did. Um, which was to the, for the better in many ways, because it also gave my brain which I now know about myself, but didn't fully want to accept for many years um, because it, it doesn't feel virtuous, but that I needed years for all of those complicated plot threads to weave into something that yeah. actually made sense in my brain. Like I had planned yeah. and plotted things, but when you get to a final book, you're like, Ooh, actually all the emotions are different than I thought they would be when I plotted all this out. And I'm not sure how I'm going to get to this very foreshadowed point Z in the story. <laughs> um, and that, so all that time away, healing and writing something else also allowed my subconscious to do some real necessary story work. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that when I sat down, I was like, oh, there you are. It's still, I love your analogy of like the bumpy gravel road. I'm going to steal that. I will credit you, of Thank course. You. No, no, no. Forever. Don't credit me. Just take it. Go with it. that's exactly it. It's exactly yeah. what it feels like. It's like sort of getting going, getting going. And then once I get through that part, the first act usually, then I'm like, I'm going. Um, Our processes are a lot alike. Mm -hmm. I've discovered mm -hmm. over the mm -hmm. years, a lot alike. And it's true that like like this third son book, which is just, even though I knew all the characters and I know basically where they end up, there was just, there's a, there was something in there that, and that I, I don't know, it, it, it had it all like settled into place. And I ended up buying this program called Aeon Timeline, which is this complex um, outlining software. So the third iteration is out now and it's pretty, and it gave me a hyperlinked way to take my notebook filled with pieces of paper and scraps. And I just plugged it all in there. Wow. And somehow doing that and having it all on this, you know, I prefer the physical things to hold on to, but putting it all in this one program somehow was that last piece of kind of shuffling it through me wow. to have, then I was able to say, okay, I can tackle this now. So, yeah. you know, it's it, part of the coping is figuring out what's the strategy I used before. Maybe that's not going to work now. Maybe I need something else. No. And that's, that's a big thing. And, and I kind of mentioned it just now, but I, 
I think what that has actually been the biggest, most important piece for me was accepting that going back to what, what you opened with, we have this idea because it is slammed into us constantly that there yeah. is one way and it is the virtuous way right every day that's virtuous outline that's virtuous yeah and um right quickly meet your deadlines all of that is virtuous and so you feel like you are a failure and even ashamed of your own process if you don't yeah. do those things yeah i do not write every day not merely because of my life but because creatively that doesn't work for me i tend to write in these spurts um this writing instructor she, she teaches more about writing life she calls it alignment um finding your process she calls it burning out like the phoenix method you write a ton you burn out you need a break and then you come back and you write a ton again and that is very much me i will i tend to write like I'll have huge, a huge week, you know, where I'll write like 20, 25,000 words and then, whew, and, and then I need a break and I, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll need like a week or two of brainstorming, thinking, kind of playing with what I just wrote, editing it, getting it in the right shape. And then I do that again. And, um, I used to think that was wrong, you know? that that wasn't right. Oh, these two weeks, I'm not writing. What am I doing wrong? Ah, I'm losing time. I'm failing. But in fact, no, <laughs> this is just the way my brain works and how I creatively output in the moment. Um, and accepting that that's okay. And in fact, is when I lean into it, I produce more faster and I'm happier. Yeah. That's, that's been really like eye-opening, transformative for me. Um, and it's really only happened in like the last year and a half. So, yeah, I, I realized that if that I just force myself to take the weekend off writing fiction so I can write other kinds of stuff. But I just like exactly. even if it's going well on Friday, I say, nope, I'm going to take two days off. So then I feel a little like I'm getting away with something, but it also allows me to just take a breather because I'm more of a I'm not so much a burst writer. Yeah. I'm more a steady state writer, but in the end, right, we get to the same place. If we're, if we're doing it the right place, we're both getting to the same amount every month or every year. Yeah. So it doesn't, you know, and, and for people who are slow writers and who aren't writing, you know, 200, 300,000 words a year, that's also completely fine, you know, or people who are writing more than that. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's just what it is that works for you without stressing you out so much that it's like you're burning, that the stress is burning twice as hard as the work is burning. Yeah, because what happens too is then this guilt creeps in. Guilt ain't healthy. It isn't. No, no, no. Yeah. And that's what I know what gets me. I feel guilty about the deadline and letting people yeah. down. I feel guilty that I can't just write to an outline like I like, would make, wouldn't that be so easy if I could just plot it out? I will make beautiful outlines. And then I sit down to write it. And I'm like, well, I don't want to write this. This is great. Yeah. Works great this on store, on paper, but I don't, I got nothing. I'm not connected to this at all. Um, and I used to think that was a failing. And now it's like, nope, that's just how you operate, Suze. Um, because that thing with stress, you know, what stress does, it causes us to second guess ourselves. Yeah. So then we have our gut instinct of, well, this is right for me. But then it was like, but. But someone said, and it's not going well right now. And, you know, I'm, I'm late or I'm going to be late. So maybe I'm doing, I must be doing it wrong. I must be. As opposed to, no, that's just how it is right now. The toddler is going to take the time the toddler is going to take. Yeah. To get her freaking shoes on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's pretty much it. And I, it's not great for the publisher, um, but I am lucky enough that they have been, my publisher tour has been extremely patient with me for many years. I've also been with them for over a decade now. So I think they know like Susan's going to get the book in. It's going to be great. We just kind of, plus, you know, yeah. when you nearly die, yeah. they kind of have to be forgiving. Um, and yeah. then my, daughter, my daughter nearly died last year. And so that's turned into a whole thing. We didn't know she had severe asthma and that ended up with us in the hospital for a while and it was horrible that uh, is that that that's as a parent I can that is I don't ever want to have to ride in an ambulance while my daughter is on oxygen again for the rest of my life thank you my little tiny toddler on yeah. a big yeah I don't ever want to do that you know I don't ever want to live in the emergency room while they try to bring her 
anyway, I don't want to do that. So I, no, no. and I was about to go on book tour the next, like the next weekend we were flying to France. I was supposed to go on the book tour in the UK for the luminaries. Um, I had a book, I had which, which light the last Witchlands book. I was supposed to be wrapping up the first half to give to my editor. Um, because it's a beast, like 200,000 plus words, you know, it's big. Wait, fantasy. how much? How much? It's over 200,000. So it's big. I mean, it's high Gold fantasy. star. Gold star. Yeah, it's high fantasy. So what do you expect? So I knew, yeah. yeah so I like was giving her the first yeah. half, but I mean, yeah. all that fucking fell apart. Yeah. <laughs> I nearly died. We didn't know she was sick and she suddenly was extremely sick. We woke up on a Sunday morning on Mother's Day and that was it. And I can't, you know, my, we canceled the tour. We canceled everything. We, I sent my editor what I had, which wasn't up to the level I wanted it to be, but here you go. This is what, this is what I have. And, um, and we had to relearn how to live. My daughter's diagnosis just kind of changed our whole lives. And so yeah. that was really hard. <laughs> and, um, yeah, the year just kind of yeah. went the we had been complaining because the year had been really hard prior to that. Um, it was just like one thing after another, one crisis after another. And she had just started daycare in December. So she was sick every weekend. So I was losing so much time and I was so behind and I was so stressed about it. And then that happened. And suddenly you're like, whatever, who cares? Like, okay, yeah. I'm losing yeah. work days, whatever. I just want my kid to be alive. Yeah. Um, and it was a good... I don't want to see a good wake up call because I would way rather not have gone through that and not have to go through that and for my daughter to be healthy. Um, but it was definitely one of those moments that really crystallizes like how very much it doesn't matter. Um, and it was, it, it helped me, even though right now I am under stress, like if Clara, my daughter were to get sick again, I would, you know, in a heartbeat, like I said, she was, she, I'm losing at least one day a week to her asthma and her having to be home. And that's fine. Sorry, publisher. Sorry, readers. Um, this is just the way it is. And it's, I used to feel a lot of should, but I really don't anymore. <laughs> I do feel like I've reached a point where I'm just, it, it's almost laughable how many things have gone wrong in the last year. So it, it feels like a sort of dog ate my homework scenario. Every time I have to tell my publisher, I'm sorry, this isn't ready. My editor, you know, like, because now this thing has happened. Oh yes. We all just got COVID. Oh yes. Now my dog died. Oh yes. Now my other dog has liver cancer. Oh yes. Now I have an ulcer. Oh yes. Now I have such bad pink eye that I can no longer see out of one eye. And I am, I have, I have permanent damage from pink eye. Who gets that? What? the hell it was a horrible year this is all last oh year oh my god and i'm not even done at all it's laughable like it's it's laughable um and so yeah and then we thought you know okay 2024 is going to be great 2024 is going to be the year it's going to be so much better if we can just get to the new year and that is when my dog died five days into this year my oh, my 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 dog my amazing oh. dog anyway it did feel like the punchline to some really cruel joke. Um, but again, you're just kind of like, all right, well, this is life. And as much as I really want to finish my books, like I can't do a whole lot about this. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and beat myself up for the fact that, you know, I have to, to deal with life right now. Um, and what that was kind of what my agent talked me down from last week. She's like, I know you value, you would never put your <laughs> in. So don't, so don't just like, she's like, we'll yeah. see where you are on this deadline. And if you're not there, then that's, we'll figure it out. But, but, um, you know, it, it, me adding that layer of guilt. And sometimes all I need is for one person, be it my agent or my editor to give me permission. Yeah. Because I can't seem to do that to myself. But when I have that external permission to let it go, do the best I can and forgive myself, I, I seem to be able to, and not always, but that was, so here's, yeah, no, yeah. But, but here's actually, you're making such important points about, about not even so much the coping element, but the, what I would call the recalibrating element. And part of that is acceptance. Mm -hmm. This is really fucked up, right? <laughs> This is fucked up. And 
and first of all, just accepting that and not fighting against, I mean, for all of us, right? Um, and then I like what you said about if you can't give yourself permission to find, if you can find the people who will say to you, you know what, this is okay. Yeah. You know, we all have, I have, we've all done, I, I have, I think a lot of us writers have done that for each other. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, X happened. And, you know, and I, and I said this and now what? And then we're like, <clears throat> we're like, it's okay. It's okay that you did that. Yeah. You know, it, it's so if we can't give it, if we can give ourselves permission, that's great. But if we can't, it's also okay not to be able to re to recognize that and to say, I'm going to find people who will say, oh yeah, this is rough for you right now. And you have to find people who will be honest. So there is perhaps a line between, you know, you're you're not taking responsibility, but yes, I mean, also, but yeah, but yeah, let's, but let's then, assume that's not the case because it's also easy to assume that anything is irresponsible. Yeah, right? I, I think someone who's not taking responsibility is also probably not someone who feels like they are. Yeah, that's a good point and drowning and letting everybody down yeah yeah i think it's the, yeah the sense that yeah the sense that i'm afraid something bad's going to happen or i'm letting people down yeah they're going to be like what's wrong with them right yeah. so yeah we, they're yeah. gonna they're gonna be like how dare they demand this book be turned in you know so i i do think that's yeah, maybe a different personality type um but yeah i i mean the I've only ever cried in my 14 years with my agent. I've only ever cried on the phone four times. And last week was one of them. And, but it was good. It was like one of those, it's like, you know me. <laughs> this is how it's true. So so <laughs> and then didn't, that was all I needed. I got it out. She calmed me down. She was like, you know, chin up. We got this. And that helped. Um, and I, I think, yeah, like it's, it's, I always, one of the, first pieces of advice I ever got when I was trying to become a published author back in like 2008, 2009, um, was from my dad, who's a fine art photographer, which fine art photography is weird. And, and most people don't really like it or get into it because it's kind of, I mean, it's art, it's fine art. So you get some weird stuff. And my dad is, is in the weird camp. Um, and no one in my family gets it. No one in my family gets it. Um, but he told me, or his advice was like, find other writers who do it, who write what you do, because none of no one else is going to get it. Yeah. yeah, and he was right, and I yeah. I still pass that advice on because you do you need these people who like understand what this pressure feels like because bless my family, they sure don't. Um, my barista, they don't get why I'm I'm weeping. <laughs> you know, they. My, uh, the, the, even my parents, my husband, my husband probably gets it just because he's been around it for so long now. But I, even him, you know, his business, he's in the automotive industry. It don't work like publishing, you know, and he just no. gets so angry at how publishing works as a, as a corporate structure, you know? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, wait, what? <laughs> They're like, well, I can't explain it. Just accept, just it's accept weird. it. Out. But, but yeah. somehow we get books out still. So I, yeah, finding other people who get it and who can talk you through things like that, it it is extremely important. Um, and it's hard to do, I know, but to find fellow writers. But uh, now that we're post COVID ish, going to conferences and things, if they're still around, is a good way to do it. That's where I met a lot of people. That's how I met you, right? Didn't I mean it you? Is. We met at Comic Con. Yes, that's right. I had a vivid burst of memory on that, on the water right there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the flip side of that, find the people, is that it is okay if you have, if you're beginning to feel that someone is not being supportive of you or is undercutting you, it is okay to push them off to the side, to not consult them, to not ask their opinion or if they give their opinion anyway, and it's something that's, you know, negging you or, yes. or, you know, undercutting what you know, um, or imposing their idea on in a way that it doesn't, doesn't match the situation. It's okay to like, take that, put it on a shelf and shut the door. Yes. You know, you I don't have, have to, it, it's easier. It's easy to say and not always easy to do, but it is okay to say, you know what, this person is not being supportive. Yeah. I don't need to listen to them. 
You know, yeah. Maybe they're supportive in other ways about other things, mm -hmm. but it's okay to say, I'm right about this, you know, and they're, they're undercutting me. So you don't need that energy. If you're already struggling with all the other stuff, you need, don't need to pull yourself up over that as well. Um, that writing instructor I mentioned before, her name's Becca Symes. She actually calls it like a lot, a low certainty person versus a high certainty person. So I have high certainty when I'm by myself, but as soon as I'm with other people, I become low certainty and I question everything about myself and yeah. about my own beliefs. And so if I am confronted yeah. with someone who is high certainty, their certainty overwhelms me and I believe what they're saying. Even though once I am by myself, I'm like, no, wait, no, no. But when I am with them in the moment, that isn't the case. And so I've learned which of my friends, people I love are like that and overwhelm my own sense of self uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I just don't engage with them with certain topics, including brainstorming. I have some writer friends. I love them, but I will not brainstorm with them because their certainty of their own ideas overwhelms my own certainty of my own story. And I can't distinguish it. And I don't yeah. like that feeling. And so I have learned which people I can go to for brainstorming where I don't feel overwhelmed. Like they're, they are same certainty level as me. I don't feel like I, I am, I am being em emotionally crushed by them. Um, and it's the same too. Like if you're going through something, some people are going to be able to give you what you need in that moment and others aren't. And it doesn't mean they're bad people. Sometimes it does, but doesn't always. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it just means that maybe they're not the people that you should be talking to. And even my own like agent, I love my agent. We've been around forever. She's very high certainty. She should be, she's an agent. Um, but I have learned as well in certain things, like what I should talk to her about and what I shouldn't, because, you know, you know, again, like brainstorming ideas, her idea might overwhelm my own. I don't agree with it, but in the moment I can't distinguish that, um, and knowing that about myself has actually been very helpful because now I'm like, oh, that's why I hate brainstorming with that person. Ah, now I know and I just won't. <laughs> you know, I love that, the high certainty, low certainty, because actually I'm exactly the same as you. Mm -hmm. I am a very decided, I don't, I don't know that I'm a confident person, but I'm like a self-contained person. Yeah. But I find myself, I'm like, why, why am I thinking that they might be right when I know what's right? But I do, I get swayed by these people coming in with their, you know, high certainty. Yeah. Um, but when I'm on my own, I'm fine. Yeah. Which is one reason I like working alone. Same. I mean, right? I, 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 I love it just my leaves friends, but I don't like doing retreats, like writer retreats, because even just like being in the same room with other people, I'm like, I'm losing my own emotions. I'm so overwhelmed by everybody else's feelings. I can't type, I can't tap into it. So yeah, I, I and that's too where I've accepted, like some people can work with the kid in the house. I am not one of them. Every emotion my daughter feels, I feel as if it's my own and I can't separate that. Um, oh, I could, I could work with my kids in the house when they were older, older, a little older. She's almost four. So once they got up to about four or five, I would just say, don't knock on this door unless there's fire or blood, but yeah. there were three of them. That's the other thing. Yeah. And they were, yeah. she can't, she's so. not great about playing by herself and that's our struggle. But like today I work, I was able to work with my husband, keeping her yeah. busy upstairs. That's fine. It's when I, it's just me and her though. This kid does not understand. Leave me alone. <laughs> Mommy, you done yet? Mommy, you done yet? You asked me three seconds ago. I'm not kidding. Three seconds. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. This was the advantage it. of having twins, which is, well, I mean, I have my eldest and then less than two years later, I had twins because that was an accident. Well, it was birth control failure, actually. <laughs> but um, we call it, we call them diaphragm babies. Um, but but the benefit of that first horrific, the, the first year was like, I don't even remember it. Um, but once they turned three, the thing mm -hmm. about twins is they entertain each other. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then their their sister would join in. And so, so there was, they didn't really need anything to do with me. So that was the benefit of that. It's not the same with um, singletons or kids or siblings who don't get along, right? Oh, who yeah. don't Who don't mesh well. Yeah. And it depends too on what I'm trying to do. Like today I was able to do it because I knew exactly what I wanted to write in a scene. But when I'm in this nebulous, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Space, I need quiet, silence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a whiteboard right here. I just 
stare at the whiteboard and think and mind map a little. Um, and I can't mm -hmm. do that with, with anyone else around. Um, Are you done yet, mommy? <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> done yet? Um, yeah. yeah. And so, but then like if I'm editing or um, know what's, what I'm writing in a scene, I can turn it off and on more easily. Uh, but the, again, this goes back to like, this whole idea of that's not virtuous, you should be able to just flip it off and write with your kid right there. This yeah. expectation that we all should just be able to do these things, just compartmentalize so easily. Well, or the flip side of that, which is the people who feel that if you're a mom or a parent, mm -hmm. um, that you shouldn't want to be doing this thing for your, this selfish thing for yourself at all anyway, until the child is a certain specified age. And that also is not true. We have, we have inner lives and we have ambitions as well, right? Yeah. And they don't have to get shoved away. There's nothing wrong with saying, I want to write also. Yeah. I had to deal with that a fair bit. Oh, I'm sure too. Kids. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And also, I'm just going to be real honest. Kids are boring. <laughs> like I'm bored out of my skull, kid. They get, yeah, but they get better. Oh, they get, I know. They're like the already, elementary school. Yes. Yes. You're seeing, already like way yeah. more interesting now yeah. than she was yeah. just a baby. And I was like, am I supposed to be in the moment enjoying this? Cause this is absolutely nauseatingly dull. Um, and it's better now, but she's at that age now where we do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And like, how many times can we play the same cycle of events and games? And so, um, yeah, it's just, it is what it is. Um, but I saw somebody, somebody, um, my in-laws family had a old, somebody had taken an old, it wasn't, it must've been an old video, I guess, like early days of video cameras of me with the three kids. And so the boys must've been like 16 or 18 months old. They must've uh -huh. been 18, at least 18. Cause they didn't start walking until they were 18 months and they're walking in the video. And then, and then Rhea is like 20 months older than them. And we're at my in-laws house and they've decided they're going to climb up onto the couch and slide down off the side. And there's me assisting them as they slide off the side. And it's like three minutes of this. And they're like having a good time. And the look on my <laughs> face is just like, I'm like, I'm like, kind Again. of like, okay, I'm trying to be a good mom. Yeah, I know. I'm so not putting any obstacles in them doing this, but I'm like, like, oh God, how many more times? Is this I know. Happen? I know. How many times do I push you on the swing? I'm so bored. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I'll you. make up a story in my head. I mean, that is what I try to do. I, it's like, I love you so much, but like, my God, oh, I have not been really everything. stimulated. I love my kids more than anything. anything but, I know. but yeah, but some people love that early age and some of us not so yeah, much. That's, that's true. And I, and that's, that's the thing. And that, but again, it goes into this, like, is you're, it's expected that you will. And if you don't, yeah. it's virtuous. It is again, yeah. you feel bad yeah. that you don't, that you're bored. Um, so if would... anybody has any questions, put them in the Q and A. We've got just about five minutes left. I want to come to some another. Actually, the thing I think that is most important because I'm really bad at it because of guilt. Um, when navigating the pressures of writing, and it's something you did because you talked to your agent last week, and that is the importance of communication. Yeah. If you're gonna be late, let people know as early as possible because they can adapt to it. The publisher and production can adapt to it this, and the better, they can adapt better the sooner they know. My guilt tends to make me clam up. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to get, I'm going to get scolded, you know, so I, I, I'll just not say anything, but that's yeah. actually not the best solution. So communicate, you know, yeah, say absolutely. so, say it. Um, doesn't mean they'll be able to get you more time, but at least they know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I definitely feel that. Um, I'm the opposite where I'm like, well, as soon as I, I try to push it. And then once I can see the writing on the wall, I'm so desperate to have some of the pressure relieved. I would rather just tell them now so they can give me more time now. And I can feel like I could breathe again. Um, but at the same time, like the luminaries seat final book, sort of got truncated uh, the schedule because they decided to release it a month earlier. And so Ooh, that really yeah. changed things a little. And then 
the Witchlands two is also coming out. So I have three books coming out in the space of a year, and I have oh. so I have books due in the space of a year. <laughs> No, um, and it's it's great. It's such a privilege to have, and I know that. Um, yeah, but, but it's yeah, a lot. It's a lot. lot, and I, you know, it's. We thought things were actually finally getting easier after my dog died. Um, she was very. I loved that dog more than anything, but she was chronically ill for the last year, so I couldn't even leave my house because I had to be there around the clock to give this dog medication. Um, and so. I did miss her terribly and it was worth it. Um, but you know, life has been easier. And then Clara, my daughter's asthma suddenly has come back with a real vengeance in the last week and a half. Um, and then That's about so hard. Yeah. yeah. And then about three weeks ago, I have mysteriously developed some vertigo and we can't figure out why. And I, I'm, I'm trying to be like, okay, some days you can write, some days you can't, like I physically can't today I had a rough morning and now I'm feeling a little better. I'm feeling better. I was wondering though earlier, like, am I going to have to email Kate? Like I can't do this because I am lying on my side and can't sit up straight. You, and you wouldn't be the first. And um, this happened with Shannon Chakraborty had to postpone hers. We had to move it for like six months, but you know what? But I'm glad she did. She felt guilty about it, but I said, no, no, you've got to take care of yourself first. Ew. You do. And that's, that's, um, put your oxygen, your own oxygen mask yeah, on exactly first. Though. That's what they always say. Right. And so I always think about that. Um, and it's true and we'll see how far I get in the next three weeks, but there's just so many things happening all at once and I can't control them. And so I've told my publisher, what's up my agent, and here we are. Um, yeah. and yeah, I agree. Warning people is it's good. It's a responsible thing to do. Um, I I don't know. Publishing has changed a lot in the last few years, though, where I'm finding that it's a lot harder to move things around than it used to be. <laughs> so, yeah, the lead times are longer. Um, so they have. Yeah, I don't. There's very rare now to see a book brought in like on short notice and bombed through um that used to happen a lot 10 15 years ago you know oh yeah and i mean even 27 2016 i remember i turned in a book and then they published it three months later oh <gasps> wow yeah. it went into copy yeah. edits and it came out three months later and they even made <laughs> other, um advanced reader copies so like but that those days are gone no those days are gone <laughs> those days are gone um, yeah yeah, it's a it's a brave new world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hopefully not like brave new world. <laughs> yes. But wait, let's end on a more. Hold on. Did anybody ask? Oh, my gosh. No one asked us any questions. Um, I'll presume to believe that it's because we have said so many things that needed saying. I always say be kind to yourself. That's the that's the foundational thing that I think we can bring to ourselves as artists, be kind to ourselves and accept that the toddler is going to take the time mm -hmm. they're going to take. Yeah. Some self-compassion. Easier said than done, but yes, it is a skill that if you can work on is worth having for all of life. Yeah. But, not just this, not just this aspect. Yeah. Uh, Cause I mean, at the end of the day, like, De deadlines aside as we kind of opened with I still love writing I, I love yeah I love writing novels and there was a time there where I really didn't because I was struggling so hard with the pressures of publishing and I know you too mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and I'm sure I will encounter that again it's part of it but I always come back to it I have ideas I need to get them down and I um yeah, it keeps me going. And I thought it, you know, even if I can't sell more books, I, I know I would still write. So there yeah. is some comfort in that, in knowing that I really love this. I, I just, when I get a new, I mean, I have like five or six, I mean, not, I have five or six back burner projects. Yeah. Poking mm -hmm. along, simmering in the back. Sometimes I go and poke them when I need a break from my other things. Yep. I really loved when you wrote about that, how important it is to take that break. Um, and that it's okay to take a break and go work on something that is like shiny and new for a minute, you know? Um, and I, uh, 
And that's, to me, one of the great things I learned by kind of letting go of as much of the guilt. I still have the guilt. I still have the worries about virtue, which I love it. I love framing it that way. But I've let go of enough of it that now I can think more about how much I love writing. Yeah. And I just, I do. I love making up these stories and setting them down. Yeah. And that's, that's the bottom line for me. Me too. And I think right now the, the industry is really fraught. It's fraught in traditional, yeah. it's fraught in indie. Things feel very unstable. I don't know anyone who's happy um, with the business side of things. Um, and it, I, I am sure we're going to see big shifts coming. They're already, they're already simmering, but I think we're going to see some pretty transformative things happen in the next few years with the shape of publishing. Um, and, and that's scary. You know, everyone's trying to crack scary. the code right now and write romanticy, but I suspect that most of us, that's not going to work. You, and you really do still have to write what you like because yeah. I don't know. I have too many friends who have written in order to meet what they thought would make the market happy. Uh, and then they didn't enjoy the writing process. And then the book didn't do that, what they wanted it to do anyway. Whereas at least for me, even when a book didn't sell, like I loved writing it. I've never yeah. written anything yeah. that I regretted writing because I, I, I never go into it with that. And, and I, I understand there is some privilege to that, but I also think there's, it's naive to think that not writing what you love is going to guarantee success because neither, neither will. So why not be happy while you're writing the thing? Right. Like, why, I why not look back on the book that. and said, oh man, look at that scene. I loved that, you know, yeah. and look at this and just feel proud of the things that you think you did well. And that it is the book you wanted to write at that moment. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm the same. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just don't want to look back and be like, oh, I was so miserable. And then that book didn't sell anyway. And what a waste of rah, rah. Yeah. Like at least, even if the book didn't sell, like I loved writing it. Yeah. Even under deadline. Like I still believed in the book and had moments of like, yes, I am amazing. Look yes. at this go. Yes. <laughs> we live for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not sure we've solved anything, but this is an insolvable problem. And all I hope we've done is given people a sense that you are not alone, that it's normal to feel under pressure, and that there are possible ways of recalibrating and helping yourself move forward. Do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I, it's only an unsolvable problem because it's no one size fits all. There is no... Yeah. It, so personal it's so subjective i think we've covered a lot of different tools that maybe people can use and try i mean it's the same with finding the right writing process you know you pick and you you try out new things you pull from what other people are doing and if it doesn't work it doesn't work you know maybe finding being around high certainty people won't bother you so cool go you <laughs> um but but maybe maybe that will be the thing that actually makes you feel a lot better is finding the the right people who will help you along um, or learning self-compassion or accepting it's not virtuous, whatever it is, you know? And, yeah. and so, yeah, pick and choose from the toolbox, try what works, try it. And if it doesn't work, that's cool. Discard. You are yeah. no obligated to yeah. use anything. <laughs> exactly. Um, Sue, so thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for being with me. March 17th, Nalo Hopkinson will be with me and we're going to talk about, I can't remember the exact, uh, creativity is a lifelong journey. I can't wait because um, I'm reading her book that's coming out in August and she hasn't had a novel published in years um, wow. and it's fantastic. It's called Black Heart Man. Um, Sarah Gailey is going to be next on the Nebula conference with the writing, um, the, the, the writing thing. I know. I can't remember the exact term for it. Um, and for those of you joining us on YouTube, thank you. As always, thanks to Nathan Lucas for doing, being tech support for this and to SIFWA for creating this platform. And once again, to Susan Dennard, who <laughs> was my fabulous return guest today. Anytime. Thank you. Anytime, as long as life allows, I will come. <laughs> <laughs>